this morning, and we're excited to worship together today. morning church. I'd like to invite you to stand if you would as we are reminded of God's great love for each and every one of us. Let's sing with all that we have this morning. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Misty Jaggers, and I am on staff here at BFC, and I am joined this morning by Amy Chamberlain, who is a member of our church board. And um, you can see there should be a picture coming up on the screen here in a minute. Um, Maybe we'll see. Well, you can imagine there was supposed to be a picture of my daughter. There she is. Um, That's my daughter, London Joy, at our BFC block party last year. If you zoomed in, you could see the look on her face. She is not the least bit intimidated that she's about to play around a basketball with some boys. And I love that she is not intimidated by that. But what I love even more is what is represented in that picture. That is a picture of our community. She is playing with friends from church and friends from this neighborhood. And in the background, there were families playing pickleball and kids jumping on inflatables and having snow cones and way too much cotton candy. And it was a beautiful picture of this community that I am so grateful for. Yeah, we've all learned to love this community so well. And what a great opportunity this is to extend this community to the people around us. Last year, we distributed over 500 door hangers to the neighbors around BFC. And that's what I think God is calling us to do. He wants us to invite a neighbor, hang a door hanger, or call a friend to extend this community to others. So our BFC block party this year is coming up in two weeks. It is October 15th, and we hope that you will make plans to join us and to invite others. There are so many people and staff and pastors working so hard to make this an incredible event. Speaking of our pastors, our pastors work incredibly hard, often up in front, um, preaching and teaching, but even more often behind the scenes, loving and ministering to us. Worldwide, every year, the month of October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And really, it's just a time to stop and intentionally thank and appreciate um, and love on our pastors who do so much for us. Yeah, just like Misty said, we are so blessed to have amazing pastors on staff that love for us, care us, pray for us, they visit us. And we are just so thankful. Would you join me and the rest of the church board celebrating these wonderful pastors and just thanking them this month? There will be note cards outside at the Welcome Center. You can grab a note card or just thank them however you would like. And you can turn those in at the Welcome Center or there's some white mailbox outside the West Entrance all month long. Thank you. I'm so grateful, you know, as we see the the opening video that we watch every week and it just shows some highlights of things happening around the church. So grateful for the ministry and the impact that the Lord has allowed Bethany First Church to have. And that continues on and on. And you've heard that this morning uh, through those announcements. But that's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. And then this evening... We are coming back here, Sunday Night Church. Can you believe it? We're coming back here, 6.30, and we're going to have a night of hymns. And remember, we want you to be a part of it. So come back and bring somebody that you know. We'd like to invite you to stand at this moment as we continue to sing praises to our God and thank him for his great love for each of us.
great, the immeasurable, strong, enduring love of God. And it's through our Lord that he gave us his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Is it in Christ alone that we stand redeemed today? Amen. That's something to celebrate today, church. In him, through him, only by him. Let's sing these great words together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ.
Standing beside me this morning is Pastor Ashley Lauder, L-A-W-T-E-R. She was born and raised in Spartanburg, South Carolina. She has the kind of accent that God intended all people to have. <laughs> she graduated from Trevecca Nazarene University, got her master's at Wesley Theological Seminary, and is an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene. And Ashley has just joined our staff. She'll be overseeing our after-school program, and she will also serve as one of our youth pastors. Would you want to make Ashley feel welcome this morning? <laughs> she's witty. I warn you, she's really easy to like and you're gonna love getting to know her. And I'm grateful that God has brought her here to us. So thankful. In the book of Acts, I love these words. They were worshiping the Lord, they were fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul to do the work which I have called them. And so after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. It was a commissioning. This morning, I'm gonna lay my hand on your shoulder and I'm gonna pray for you. And I believe that God has sent you here. And I want um, to be amazed at what God does through you. And I believe I will be. So Lord, bless Ashley today, I pray. I thank you for her. She has leaned in. She believes she has heard your call. She has come here to serve and to minister, to love and to care for kids. This, this is what she's been giving her life to. And Lord, we pray that you'll use her here as she is the face of Jesus to the kids in this community and the after school program as she is the face of Jesus, along with Pastors Brighton and Pastor Ben, as she loves on the kids in this church and the kids that are coming into this church. I, I pray, Lord, that under this ministry, that young people's lives will be forever changed to follow Jesus closely and to make him the Lord of their lives and to live the best life possible. Bless Ashley, I pray and use her in ways that will even surprise her. In Jesus' name, amen. Good. Okay. So how many of you, when you come in on Sunday morning, you uh, come in the West Entrance? Just raise your hand, really. Have you noticed the words on the wall in the West Entrance? Even if you don't come in that entrance, have you walked down that hallway and noticed what's written on the wall? Here's what it says. It says, we are passionate about becoming more like Jesus and helping others come to know him. So if you come to this church and you are a follower of Jesus, we are not saying that we are really not interested in ministering to you. It's the opposite. We want to help you become more like Jesus. But we also would like to help other people come to know Jesus. Do you agree? Kind of some of you slightly agree. 
Should, should we go again? But we are interested in helping other people come to know Jesus. Do you agree? Yes. We do. And so we're not saying that we aren't interested in people who are already in the faith. We are. And we want to shepherd people in the faith. But we also want to help people who are not yet in the faith come to know Jesus. And so we've been dreaming. We've been dreaming. We've been saying, what if God gave us hundreds of people over these next three years that would just come into this saving relationship with Jesus and then they could be discipled to become more like Jesus? And so I was speaking to a group of pastors recently and I told them about my mother. Uh, I shared with them how my mother worked at a little factory in our hometown of Columbia, Kentucky, all of my years growing up, a sewing factory called Oshkosh. Well, for some reason that got a reaction. <laughs> and, and so my mom would get up every morning early. She would be um, sitting in her seat at the factory at 730. On Sunday morning, she got up earlier because um, she taught Sunday school all the years uh, until just a few years ago of her life, uh, from being a, just a young teenage girl until she was, just felt like she was too old to teach. On Saturday morning, she got up even earlier because on Saturday morning, she would get up early enough to get all the laundry done for the week. She would get the house clean for the week. She would go to the grocery, get the grocery shopping done for the week because she guarded Saturday afternoons. Because on Saturday afternoons, my mom went fishing. But not for fish. Do you remember what Jesus said to his followers? I'm gonna make you fishers of, fishers of men. So she would go to our little town several miles away. She would park her car on one side of the street and she would go down the street knocking on every door of every house, asking them, how could I pray for you? And do you have a church that you attend? And then when she got to the end of the street, she would come back up the other side of the street, get in her car, park it somewhere else and do the same thing again. That was Saturday afternoons. The people who said yes to my mother's invitation to church, most of them were people who needed a ride. And I've joked with you over the years that when I got my license at the age of 16 in a car, I got a list. And I would come rolling in church every Sunday as a 16-year-old boy in my new car, loaded with gals. More mature gals, older gals in their 70s and 80s, but loaded with gals. That, that was my mom's life, that's, that's my heritage. I, I remember distinctly one memory I wanted to share with you, and that is that one, one night we were awakened from our sleep, all four of us kids, and, and, my, and my dad said, get, get your clothes on, kids, we gotta go to town. It was several miles away, and, and we're trying to wake up and trying to understand why do we have to get our clothes on and go to town, and my dad says, well, you know so-and-so, he named a couple, yeah? Well, mom's been talking to him about Jesus. And, and they are so concerned tonight about their spiritual condition that they wanna to pray to receive Jesus tonight. And so we loaded all four of us up in the Dodge Dart with my mom and dad, and we drove into town. My, my, my dad didn't want my mom driving into town that late by herself. We were too little to leave at home, so we all went. And the four of us lined up on a couch wearing our little coats, watched my mom lead some people to Jesus. What a heritage. My mom had a mission. She had been sent for a specific purpose. My mom believed that Jesus had sent her just like the Father had sent him to share this good news with people. But you have a mission as a follower of Jesus Christ. I have a mission as a follower of Jesus Christ, right? Didn't Jesus say, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you? Now go, make disciples. But it seems to me that the mission of Jesus has fallen on hard times. And as his followers, we are struggling to carry it out. 
I remember a few months ago reading an article about Christians and our struggles with sharing our faith that was done by LifeWay Research. And the message the article was trying to communicate was that there was a poll that had been taken of people in America who are not professing to be Christians. And they said, I have many friends who are not, who rather are Christian. Non-Christians in America said, I have many Christian friends, but they have never talked to me about how or why I should become a Christian. You say, Rick, when you, when you read something like that, an article that talks about how these non-Christians in the United States of America say I have many Christian friends, but none of them have ever stopped to talk to me about how or why I should become a Christian. Does that make you frustrated with this congregation? I think I'm most frustrated with the guy who looks back at me in the mirror. And, and, and I begin to say to myself, God, I can do more. And, and I can't lead you where I've never been. So what we learned from the book of Jonah, the central theme is what? Do you remember? God loves all people, right? Try to, try to grasp hold of this, okay? God loves all people, including our enemies. That's what Jonah is about. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with the fact that God loves all people, including the people who aren't good or kind or nice to you or who would hurt you if they could? Are you okay with the fact that God loves people who, who would cause you great harm if it was in their power to do so? And not only does he love all people, including our enemies, but here's what the book of Jonah is about. He wants us to tell them that he loves them. And he wants us to love them too. And I think we're going to get to this place where we just say, wait a minute. Didn't we just grasp the fact that we're struggling to tell our friends? We're not even doing well with telling our friends about Jesus. Now, now you're trying to say that we've got to tell people who would be like enemies, who would cause us harm if they could, and we have to love them also? Because I believe as we come to the last sermon in the book of Jonah, I think that's what we are learning. And so let me take you to the book of Jonah in a moment. I want to begin with chapter 4. I, I did get a cartoon this week from my friend Mike, and I thought it was worth showing you. Okay, I'll put that up for you. Simply says, uh, you've been three days late, you smell like fish, and now what kind of story are you expecting me to believe this time, Jonah? Yeah. Okay, not a big laugh. Maybe I shouldn't have shown that one. <laughs> Let me take you to chapter four. Th this is probably even going to fall flatter. A uh, little boy going to church one Sunday, and, um, and his neighbor said, oh, I see you're going to church. He's out in the front yard. Yes. Uh, you believe everything in the Bible? Well, of course I do. Do you even believe that Jonah got... Swallowed by a fish? I sure do, he said. He said, well, what if, what if he didn't get swallowed by a fish? What if it's not true? And the little boy said, well, I'm going to ask him when I get to heaven. <laughs> and the man said, what if Jonah didn't go to heaven? The little boy said, well, do you, then you can ask him. <laughs> I got a bigger laugh. <laughs> hey, up in the booth, we're going to ditch the cartoon in second, and I'm going to go with that story, okay? Here we go, chapter four, verse one. Let, let me summarize, I'm, I'm just all over the place, aren't I? So you remember the story, if you weren't here, just very quickly, Jonah is called by God to go and preach to the great city of Nineveh because they are very bad people and God loves all people. And Jonah says, I don't wanna go. They're our enemies. <laughs> I don't want to tell our enemies about God's love for them. I don't want them to be saved. I want them to be destroyed. And so he runs, runs from God, runs the opposite direction, gets on a boat, heads away, 
There's a great storm. He finally convinces the sailors, it's all about me running from God. You should throw me overboard. They do, reluctantly. He thinks it's the end of his life, but God sends a fish. And he spends three days in the belly of the fish. And he repents, kind of. And this fish spits him onto dry land. And he is called the second time, go to Nineveh and preach. I love these people. Reluctantly, he goes. And they all repent. And the city is saved. And everybody is happy but Jonah. You ready? Chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God. I know that you're slow to anger, you're abounding in love, you're a God who relents from sending calamity. It's like, I'm so upset that you're such a good God. Now, Lord, just take away my life. I'd, I would rather die. It's better for me to die than to live. I don't want to deal with the, the embarrassment or being a false prophet or the fact that my enemies have survived. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and he sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter and he sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Who knows, maybe they'll go back to their old ways and God will destroy them after all, right? And then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade. Wow. For his head to ease his discomfort and Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And he wanted to die again. <laughs> he wanted to die a lot, didn't he? And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. I've lost my comfort. I've lost the shade of the plant that you provided over me. Now I'm hot in this sun. I'd, I would just rather die than to be uncomfortable. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I do wish I were dead. And here's the point of the book of Jonah. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend to it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals right from the left, meaning people who don't really have very little have no to little knowledge of God and what's right and what's wrong. Should not be concerned, Jonah. My wife, Annette, and I have, uh, and I think I've mentioned it before, we have a granddaughter. <laughs> Brought a picture. She's growing up, isn't she? She's nine. And she just keeps filling our lives with joy. Uh, she, she's like any, any grandchild that any of you have. There's, there's days when she's just as happy and joy-filled and life couldn't be better. And, and of course, there's also times in Sadie's little life when she's trying to work through something or concerned about something. You can take it down. I think that's good. We love her. The one thing I love about my relationship with Annette is she understands my love for Sadie like nobody else in the world. When I want to tell her something that Sadie did or said, she is all in. When I talk to you guys about my grandkids, you just stare at the ceiling. <laughs> Not Annette. We, we love her. And, and if she's concerned about something in her little nine-year-old mind, we're concerned. You, you understand she is the object of our love. Do you know who was the object of God's love in this story? The very wicked sinful 
evil people of Nineveh. You have to let it soak a minute, don't you? The feelings of love that we have for Sadie, God says, yep, I get it. I've got a city full in Nineveh and I love them like you love Sadie. To Jonah, it seemed wrong. God's mercy being poured out on these people. If they're spared, then they're a greater threat to us. I'd, I would rather die than to face the Assyrians. That, that, that there's a side note here that I think you have to lean into, and that is that, that Jonah wants to blame somebody else for his own disobedience. In fact, he says, God, I think I'll just blame you. I've done something really wrong here, but I don't want to own it, so I'll just blame somebody else, and God, you seem to be as good as anybody. I'll just blame you. The, the, the reason in the first place that I did not obey, you know why I didn't obey you? Because I know that you're a compassionate, loving, caring, good, gracious father. There you go. That's why I didn't go. And, and, and I don't want to just breeze by because I think there might be somebody in the room this morning that needs to be aware of these very words that God loves you, God is gracious, God cares for you, God is concerned about you, he is compassionate, God loves you. And so when we get up on Sunday morning and say, God loves all people, we're talking about you. God loves you. And so I think the reason it's so important for me to get up here on Sunday morning and stand here and say, hey, do you understand that God loves all people, including our enemies? Is because God loves all people, including our enemies, even if we don't, like Jonah didn't. God is just full of love. He wants to die, he's so upset. And here's why he wants to die. Grasp this. Because you remember when he was tossed overboard and he thought his life was over and he was going to be destroyed? And you remember how God sent the fish to rescue him? That mercy, that grace he received, he loved receiving God's mercy. Chapter 2 is all about all of this mercy that I've received from you, God. Look at what you, you have spared my life. I mean, I was tossed in the depths of the sea and instead of being destroyed, you rescued me. And now he says, I'm really mad because you've extended that same grace to other people. Have you ever been tempted to be frustrated when God extended the same grace to somebody else he extended to you? So what are we going to do with all of this that we've been dealing with for the last few weeks? Mother Teresa founded the uh, Missionaries of Charity. My, uh, my journey with her started when a friend back in Cincinnati gave me a book about her. And, and instantly, it seemed like it was created in my heart a desire to learn more about her. I've, I've gone back and I've listened to, not easy to understand, but interviews that she's given and speeches she's made. She, she said that she believed that God had called the missionaries of charity to give service to the poorest of the poor, wholehearted service to the poorest of the poor. That's the deal. And, and she had an inspiration once where she believed that God was calling her to, and the missionaries of charity, to serve the poor by leaving the convent and living among them in the city. So they did. She said, I've seen poverty. 
and, and I've seen hunger. But she said, when I come to the U.S., I see a greater poverty, a deeper hunger. She said, when I come to the U.S., I see a spiritual poverty. She said, I call it the poverty of affluence. You have so much. You are so wealthy according to worldly standards that you have begun to believe that wealth can satisfy every longing in the soul, and it can't. And so you live deceived and hungrier than any other group of people on the face of the earth because your wealth can't satisfy you. The, the reason I think I know so much about comfort and our addiction to being comfortable is because I'm a recipient of comfort. And I live a very comfortable life. I, I think it's what makes me an expert. I, I, I think about everything that we take for granted every day of our lives. Not, not just a mattress, but a nice mattress. A high dollar mattress. Warm water, we couldn't imagine existing without hot water heaters. More than enough food, too, too much food. An overabundance of food, push the food away. I found myself yesterday saying, I need to stop eating so much. Just, we, we just live such comfortable lives. In, in, in fact, we have created zones that we call comfort zones. And I want to stay in my comfort zone. I, I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. This right here, this is my zone. I'm in it right now. I'm comfortable. And, and comfort has become an addiction to us. It's even part of Jonah's story. You understand that Jonah becomes addicted to comfort. He goes outside the city and he says, I'm going to build a shelter. I'll just pull up a chair and see what happens. Who knows? Maybe they'll go back to their old ways and God will end up destroying them anyway. You never know. And then there's this plant. It provides shade and it makes him happy. Now I'm comfortable. But then God sends a worm and he chews the plant. And there's a strong east hot wind and he gets faint and he says, you know what? I'm uncomfortable now. I just wish I could die. I don't like being uncomfortable. There's no concern for Nineveh. But he wishes he could die because he has lost his comfort. And finally, the point is made. You're, you're concerned about this plant. Are, are you even thinking? Do you understand why I should be concerned about the city of Nineveh? So here's the question I want to ask you. What if we cared about people who are far from God as much as we care about being comfortable? What, what if you and I cared about people who are far from God as much as we care about living comfortable lives? And, and I think there's something happening in our heads right now, Sam. Can we do both? I'm willing to give it a shot, but I don't want to lose this. How often do we grieve over the loss of comfort and how seldom do we grieve over the loss of souls? I'll, I'll, I'll close I've heard the story 
in different forms. I've read it in different forms, but in 19, 1850s, rather, William Booth began ministry. He, he was the founder of the Salvation Army. He, he, he was different in his approach, and all the church folks in the mid-1800s wasn't okay with his approach. In, instead of inviting them to church, he went to the streets of London to the drunks and the prostitutes, the homeless, the hurting, the destitute, and he shared Jesus with them. And he recruited an army to help him eventually, called the Salvation Army. You remember the story of the lady who told her, I don't agree with your approach to evangelism? He said, well, what's your approach? She said, well, I don't have one. He said, well, then I like mine better than I like yours. Yeah. And so on Christmas Eve, just a year or two before his death, he was pretty feeble. He sent a telegram to all the soldiers in the army to inspire them. And it was only one word. Do you remember what it was? Others. others. What if we just focused on others? What if we set our own comfort to the side and we became passionate about others? What if we really did begin to believe that we have been sent on a mission? And that God has a purpose for us. So when you came in this morning, you received elements. Let, let me talk to you for a minute about as Wesleyans, what we believe about the Lord's Supper. We, we believe, as Wesley would talk about, means of grace or channels of grace. How does, God, how does God change us? How does God impart grace into our lives? And Wesley talked about the Lord's Supper being one of the ways in which we receive grace. And so as we eat and drink, we take into our bodies Jesus and his grace and so this morning, I believe communion is more about a prayer that says, Lord, give me your grace to be a witness for you. Give me your grace to be on mission for you. And so if you would open the bread first. And remove it from the container. When Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them and he said, this is my body, I want you to eat it, all of you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for the ransom of many. How appropriate, huh? That many would be ransomed. I want you to drink it, every one of you, and be thankful. So for its grace that we pray, Lord, this morning. Give us the grace, the power to be your witnesses. To share the good news of Jesus, your son, with others. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I
and the grace and peace and the strong love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for joining us today at Bethany First Church. I hope today's message inspired you uh, to think less about our comfort, to think more about those who are far from God. We're so grateful that you joined us this morning, and we'd love it if you'd follow us. There's a number of